Good morning, Sabbath School. This has been a, an eventful week, and I am thankful for, at least in part, some of the events that have taken place. I am thankful that the Supreme Court ruled, at least in part, the correct way. We'll see what happens with the other part. Did any of you um, notice the news this morning? The largest volcanic eruption ever uh, recorded from space occurred this morning, or yet last night, I guess, over in Tonga. One of the clips that I saw on that uh, eruption was taken in a church. And it was taken by a family or an individual who was at the church for choir practice. It didn't say which church it was, but I have to almost wonder if it was a Friday evening choir practice for today's Sabbath service. And at the time of the clip, uh, the water going through the church was about this deep. So Tonga is being overflowed with a tsunami at this point in time or is... Uh, draining out now, probably. But um, as we worship today here in our dry, warm church, let us remember that there are people around the world who are not so fortunate. But God is good, and God is in control, and for that we can be thankful. Before we begin our Sabbath school, let us just bow our heads and let us have an opening prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love, your care, your watchkeeping. We thank you that you are aware of not only our situation, but situations of other believers around the world, and we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be very close with them. Please bless us as we open your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we will have Mission Spotlight, and then we will go directly into our lesson study. When Bino turned three, his mom decided that she wanted him to go to an international school in Timor-Leste. An international school is not like a regular public school. Going to a public school in Timor-Leste doesn't cost any money, and the teachers speak Portuguese. Going to an international school, however, costs money, and the teachers speak English. Bino's mom wanted him to learn English. So she asked his dad to find an international school in Dili, the capital of Timor-Leste where they lived. Bino's dad found several international schools, but they were all too expensive. Then he walked past a Seventh-day Adventist church. He saw a sign on the church fence advertising the Timor Adventist International School. A phone number was on the sign, and he called for more information. To his delight, he learned that they could afford to send Bino to the school. Bino's parents were not Adventist, but they had heard about Adventists before. His mom's uncle was an Adventist. Bino started to study at the Adventist school. He quickly began to learn English, and because of him, his mom did too. Every day when Bino came home from school, she asked him to teach her the English words that he was learning at school. Hello, said Bino. Hello, his mom repeated. Goodbye, Bino said. Goodbye, she repeated. As the weeks and months passed, their English lessons grew more complicated. I love you, Bino said. I love you, his mom exclaimed. English was not the only thing that Bino taught her after school. Every day, Bino heard Bible stories from his teachers, and he told his mom about David and Goliath, Jonah and the big fish, and Jesus and the little boy whose lunch fed more than 5,000 people. She loved hearing her little boy tell Bible stories. Bino's parents began reading the Bible. Sometimes they had questions about what they were reading, so they talked with the pastor of the Adventist church near Bino's school and an American missionary who also lived on the island. The pastor and the missionary visited Bino's house regularly. The day came that Bino's parents were baptized and joined the Adventist church. Today, Bino not only goes to the Adventist school, but his parents go to the school too. They work as the school's caretakers. Because of the school, the whole family now speaks English. 
But more importantly, they love Jesus with all their hearts. A few years ago, part of the 13th Sabbath offering helped to open the Adventist school in Dili. This quarter, the 13th Sabbath offering will help build a dormitory so children from faraway villages can study and live at the school. Thank you for giving to this special offering. All right. We are studying the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, and we are on lesson three. That does not mean we're on chapter three, however, of the book of Hebrews, <laughs> if you noticed in the uh, study today. Uh, we're on lesson three, which is entitled, The Promised Son. The Promised Son. What does the word promised imply? A commitment, okay, yes. I'll give you a point there, yes, okay. That it's been mentioned, okay, yes. I'll give you a point there too. That's not what I'm looking for. What does the word promised imply? Oh, that's an interesting word. I hadn't thought about that. I'll give you two points. Yeah. Oh, yes, three points for the gentleman over here on the right hand, yes. The word promised implies something that's going to happen in the future, okay? It's a promise. It's something that we can look forward to in the future. Now, some of what we're going to talk about today is going to be review of some of the things we talked about last week, because some of these themes seem to kind of repeat. So I want to go over a few things to kind of help set the stage for what we're going to be looking at today. First of all, we talked about last week that of the different books in the Bible, the book of Hebrews is a very important book. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if we didn't have the book of Hebrews, we would have a very difficult time really understanding a lot of things that we understand because of the book of Hebrews. There's really no other book in the Bible that pulls all the pieces of the puzzle together and actually makes a picture as clear as what we find in the book of Hebrews. We also talked last week about the fact that the disciples as they were called, as they walked with Jesus, as they learned from Jesus, as they were taught by Jesus, they, everything that they learned and everything that became a part of them as a result of that interaction was within a very, um, a very specific worldview as to what they expected to happen. In other words, put it another way. During the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life on this earth before the crucifixion, Jesus knew where he was going. The disciples did not know where he was going. Yes, he talked about it. Yes, he said things. But they were looking for a temporal king who would come in and save Israel from the Romans. That was what they were looking for. And in fact... When Jesus joined the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he spent the entire time showing them from the Old Testament how, in fact, everything that had happened that they thought was a disaster was, in fact, the fulfillment of what God had predicted would happen to the Messiah. So the disciples thought they understood who Jesus was but missed the boat to a great degree. <clears throat> now, the one thing that's interesting about the disciples and their view and what they thought was going to happen and what they expected to happen is that I don't know that any of them expected Jesus to ascend back to heaven. 
Now, Jesus told them that he was going to go back to heaven, but it was not something that was part of their expectation of what the Messiah would do. And I can only imagine the questions that must have been in their minds as Jesus went to heaven. On the one hand, I'm sure there was, I don't know what their emotions would have been, but Jesus went to heaven. Now, the other person that we talked about last week was Saul. Saul also had some very, very strong convictions as to who Jesus was. He was a traitor. He was a danger to the Jewish people. And anybody who followed Jesus or identified as a Christian was to be cut off. And so we have Saul, who is on the other side of the equation, and he also is confronted with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And Saul also has to go back and look at the Old Testament, look at his presuppositions, and ask himself the question, how do I, how do I bring continuity between what I thought was and what I now believe, or what seems to be evident in terms of the fact that there is a God, in he a Jesus in heaven, who has spoken to me and revealed himself to me, and obviously is up there. I believe that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul to answer the conundrum that he faced after having, meet, meeting, uh, having, having met Christ on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> now, that's at the junction of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I want to go back to the very beginning. And the beginning really is in heaven. And we're familiar with the story. Lucifer, one of the archangels, maybe the archangel, senior archangel. I don't know exactly what the ranking is and how that all works in heaven, but an archangel. Lucifer begins to question the way God operates the way God runs the universe. And in Ezekiel 28, verses 14 and 15, we have this statement. It says, you, referring to Lucifer, were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you, or iniquity was found in you. God and Lucifer, as we understand it, engaged in conversation, in dialogue, in argument, maybe even. But eventually, that conversation moved outside of the two of them, the two entities, into heaven at large. And Lucifer began to lay the groundwork by asking, um, raising doubts about the kind of person God is. And eventually, things became so unsettled in heaven, and, and it's hard for us to even imagine what that must what, what that would look like, but became so unsettled that in Revelation, we have the situation being described as what? As war. There was war that, that broke out in heaven. And Michael and his angels prevailed, Michael referring to Christ, and Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. 
It seems to imply that a third of the angels of heaven were cast out with Satan, and two-thirds remained in heaven. Exactly what happened and over what time frame at that point in time is, is a little, it's, there's a lot of information we don't know. But Satan apparently eventually was able to tempt, deceive Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that, that created a change of rulership, so to speak. Adam had been identified as the, as the king, if you will, of, of, the, of planet Earth. But by submitting to Satan, um, that rulership transferred to Satan. And then Adam and Eve lost their garden home and were cast out. Now, it's at this point in time, at this event, that we have a very interesting uh, interaction that takes place. <clears throat> God calls, um, let's see, what do I, how do I say this? Uh, the the, um, the parties involved together. He calls uh, Adam and Eve, and he brings Satan slash the serpent, and he himself is present. And we have this statement in Genesis 3, verse 15, that is very interesting. Who is the I in this statement? Who, who's, who's I? Anybody? Jesus. Okay. Jesus is the I. Jesus says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who is the you? Lucifer slash the serpent. And the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, this offspring, her offspring, will bruise your head, referring to the serpent, and you, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. Now, the lesson, I'm not sure how to go about this next step here because there's an interesting little divergence that I'm not quite sure how to make this all make sense. But if you, if you look at this statement here, is it specific or general? <laughs> Trick question here. It, it's a general plan, yes. It, it, it talks in, in, in a general sense your offspring, her offspring, it does get specific in that it, it narrows it down to a he. Okay, so we've gone from this group down to a small, in, you know, to one individual, but it doesn't really tell us anything about who that individual is. Now, the lesson makes this statement, and if you wanna, if you wanna open up your quarterly on page 20, it reads as follows. This is the very last sentence in the quarterly on page 20. And it makes this statement. What neither Adam and Eve, Abraham, nor David probably ever imagined, however, was that their Redeemer would be God himself. Now, the reason I'm a little conflicted here is this. And that is that if I read the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, it seems to indicate a little different perspective in that it, Ellen White does talk about the fact that the angels did unfold to significant detail the plan of salvation.
the plan of salvation was unfolded to the angels to enough of a degree that they were willing to offer their own th themselves as a sacrifice rather than Christ having to do that. So there seems to be, and I, I don't know that they're in conflict, but what does seem to appear is this, <clears throat> and, I, and I, I think this is what is really going on, and that is that at the beginning of this whole controversy, there was enough information provided to help Adam and Eve understand, number one, the seriousness of their actions, the consequences of their actions. This was not just going to cost them their Eden home. This was going to put the entire Godhead at risk because God was going to risk everything to make it possible for them to be restored back to what they had lost. Now, <clears throat> this is the thing that I think is interesting. How many of you have ever been in a situation in which somebody has warned you or described for you something that is going to happen in the future? And you, your response is, uh-huh, uh-huh, oh yeah, okay. And then when you get to that point or that event, <laughs> it's a whole lot different than what you thought it was going to be as described by you back here in time. Have you ever had that experience? In other words, reality oftentimes is very different than what we think it's going to be. And so I think that one of the things that was going on here is, is that, yes, um, you can talk about it, but until you actually experience it, it doesn't really sink in. Yeah, and it takes time. That's exactly. Now, the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind is this. And I don't know how cosmic battles are fought. I've never been engaged in one in which I'm really at play here. But, we, but let's never forget that, you know, we, we use the phrase, the great controversy, as if it's a debate. Is that all that's going on between God and Satan? I mean, I look around this room here, and I'll bet you that there are stories that could be shared here that reveal that this is more than just a debate. Amen. This involves pain. This involves life and death. This involves loss, eternal loss, or eternal salvation. This is a serious engagement. And you've heard me, and you've heard me talk about you know, the rules of engagement and things like that. I have to believe that there are things that God does or has done that Satan did not expect at the moment. Amen. You know, if you've ever played chess, or oh, let's just, let's get, actually, I, I'm, I shouldn't even speak of chess because I don't even really know much about it. But checkers, you know, I think most of us have played checkers. And you know, you're making your moves and you're making your moves. And you think you're doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, the person on the other side goes, it's like, whoa, how did that happen? Yeah? Well, that's kind of what's going on here. God and Satan are moving on the chessboard of this world all the time. And exactly how much God revealed 
when he pulled the plan of salvation off the shelf, so to speak, and put it into play? I don't know. But I believe that only as much as was revealed as needed in order to move this process forward. Yes, Ke uh, Kelly. Every choice that we make can be life or death. Yes, exactly. There, every, it, there, there are consequences that could take us in, in very seriously. Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, the lesson today, The Promised Son, begins on Sunday with the title of In These Last Days. And if you look in your Bible, Hebrews 1, very first, uh, or excuse me, the second verse, it says, well, we'll read verse 1. It says, long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So what's this verse doing? What are we contrasting with the, in this verse? What is Paul contrasting? What's that? Paul is contrasting. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yep. I, I, that's very true. We always think we're at the end of time. Okay, but is this what's what Paul is talking about? Is he talking about the end of time here? No. Yes. Okay, yes, I like that. But, but I'm looking at this in these last days. What, what is he talking about here? What I see him here is he's, he's talking about long ago versus right now. That's exactly right. Now... <clears throat> I don't think that what Paul is talking about is the end of time. He's just simply talking about the fact that we're going to talk about things that are important right now. And what is the book of Hebrews focusing on that's important right now? Who Jesus is and where he is and what he's doing. That's exactly right. Because you've got, you've got the disciples, you have Paul himself, who are completely missing the big picture. And Paul is, is starting out this book of Hebrews by saying, you know what? We're going to talk about what's important right now. And that is number one important. Who is Jesus? Where is he? And what is he doing? Okay, so let's just look at this a little, a little more differently. Sorry, Kelly, let me keep moving here because I, I got to keep moving here. Okay, so let's contrast. Long ago, to whom? To our fathers. By whom? By the prophets. Okay, so that's in the past. That's how God spoke to us in the past. However, Paul is now saying... Take note, today, to whom? Us. Who's talking? Jesus. So Paul is identifying for us, or contrasting, if you will, what God has done in the past, which they all knew, they all knew about that, but now Paul is bringing the focus to the moment. And he's saying, God's speaking to us today, and he's spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we've already talked about Paul and his interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul now continues in verses 3 and 4, identifying for us characteristics about this son that God is speaking to us through, through uh, whom speaking to us through whom? Is that a word? I don't think that's a word. Anyway, let's start. <laughs> but let, let, here we are. So these are the points that we find here in this, in this next verses. Number one, God's son, the one who has spoken to us, 
First of all, he is the radiance of the glory of God. We're going to come back to that. Number two, he is the, the exact imprint of God's nature. Let me ask you a question. What does the word imprint mean to you? Yeah. Um, so what, what's an example of an imprint that we all carry around in our pockets all the time? <laughs> okay. I will give you a point for creativity there. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking of money. I'm thinking of money, coins, you know? How, do, how are those coins made? It's imprinted, okay? It's stamped on there, okay? And, and every penny, every dime, nickel dime, whatever else comes out, they're all supposed to be exactly the same, okay? Well, what is this? Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature, okay? Let's continue on. This son who has spoken to us, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. For he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And number five, he is much superior to angels. Now let me ask you a question. Is this the Jesus that the disciples walked and talked with. <laughs> you felt, okay. Yes and no. They never saw this in Jesus, did they? I mean, I don't think they realized it. You're absolutely right. Yes, he was that same Jesus. But this is the, this is the, um, this is the Jesus that they needed to come to understand who he was because they were still remembering him as the, as the, as the man walking along the beach on the, on, on the shores of Galilee. Okay, sandaled feet, hot and sweaty. A, a carpenter, yeah, retired carpenter. Okay, and, and Paul is setting the stage here that this Jesus who did die, and who was resurrected, this is really who he is. He's these things. He is, he is God himself. Okay, exactly. Now, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever give clues in his teachings as to who he really was? Can you give me some examples? Okay. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. If you look at the Gospels, and I thought about that, it's very interesting if you look at the Gospels. The scribes and Pharisees, the religious rulers, what was it that really got them bristled up? When he claimed to be God, when he said, I am that I am, when he said things like, um, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. Who do you think you are? You're a carpenter. A little, a little illegitimate son, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Now, the other story that I thought about that Jesus told is the story of the unfaithful uh, stewards. Okay? Now, the focus of that story was the unfaithful stewards. But who was central to that story? Half a point. Keep going. The son who was killed. Yeah, that's right. You know, he, he builds, his father builds the, the vineyard. He, he leases it out to, to stewards. The crop is harvested. He now sends a servant, a servant to get his, his share of the crop. And finally, after having them all been abused and killed and destroyed and whatever else, he sends his son. Maybe they will listen to him. Maybe they will honor him. And instead, they kill him also. So 
You know, Jesus gave hints and, and clues, but the reality was, it's in the book of Hebrews that it really is laid out in very, very clear terms. Now, let me ask you a question. What does the word glory mean to you? Because one of the characteristics is the glory of God is radiant in him. What does glory mean to you? The Shekinah glory. Okay. All right. Anything else? What's that? Admiration. Admiration. Okay. Now, hmm. Now let's let's see if we can bring some balance here. So you mentioned the Shekinah glory. I've also got a picture here of the <clears throat> Mount Sinai when God appeared uh, to Israel uh, out of Mount Sinai, and it's very interesting if you read there in Exodus twenty-four. It says, the glory of God <clears throat> was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of, of people of Israel. <clears throat> so that's visible. Now, you mentioned the word admiration. Can you bring these two pictures, fire from a mountain, Shekinah glory, and admiration together under the word glory. What is it that makes God truly glorious? His character. His character. Is that good news? Yes. So, this Yes, of course. Okay. So, if we're if we're talking about God's glory being his character, when we um, reflect his glory, we're actually reflecting his character in the way we live our lives. Did I did I say that correctly? Okay, so, um, so when, <clears throat> when, 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 <laughs> when Saul met Christ on the road to Damascus, I believe two things happened. One, he was, he was confronted with the glory of my slides aren't advancing, are they? Um, okay, we'll get that. He was confronted with the glory of God that knocked him off what? His horse, or whatever he was, or on the ground. But at the same time, I believe he was also confronted with the holiness of God and the and the. What, what Saul recognized was how off base he was in relationship to the voice that was speaking to him from heaven. His character, God's character. He experienced two things. Okay. Oh, and his own character. Okay, his deficiencies in his own character. I like that. I'm going to have to give him three points, too. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so I think I've lost my slides here, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Yes, the Holy Spirit is at play, no question about it. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm sorry here, my slides, I'm talking about things and you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's probably true most of the time. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, well, okay, we'll have to work with our lesson quarterly then. So, <clears throat> um, on Monday, it says, God has spoken to us by his son. Um, what's interesting about the, the speaking <clears throat> is that had God spoken to the children of Israel over the course of history? And the answer is yes. Hebrews alludes to that, the prophets in the past. However, had there been a silence for a long period of time? And the answer is yes also. In fact, I believe that from the last time that God had actually spoken through a prophet was now almost how many years? 400 years. Now, um, can you imagine how long 400 years is? It's a long, long time. Well, I know, not for God. That, <laughs> that's true, not for God. <clears throat> but, you know, 400 years, I, I'm at the point now in my life where <clears throat> I can say, oh yeah, 50 years ago, this. And it's like, whoa, man, that's a long time ago. Don't like to remind myself of that. But, um, God had not been speaking through prophets for a long period of time. Why do you think that was the case? And I don't know the answer. I was hoping some of you might have an answer. Maybe people had not been searching for God? Maybe, I don't know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So let's see here. Where are we at? Um, so, into the, okay, now I, I, yes, and this is, I think, one of the challenges that God faces, and that is, what's the point of more information if you're not even listening to what I've already provided you? And, and I believe that what God had revealed had, had, had been adequate. Okay. So... <clears throat> I just realized I've got time that is not stopping here. I'd like to look at Thursday very briefly. And it says, today I have begotten you. This is verse four, five. <clears throat> and this is a verse that has caused a lot of um, challenges for people trying to figure out what exactly this means. I think where most people get off base on this verse here is they assume that this has to do with God um, creating Jesus. That is not what is being identified here, I believe. <clears throat> the lesson makes it very clear that the word begotten can also be translated as instilled or adopted by God as the promised ruler, the son of David. <clears throat> now, um, if, we, if we keep this in perspective, before the cross, did God identify who Jesus was? And we have two times when that happened. One was at Jesus' baptism, and the other one as, was at the transfiguration. And in both of those situations, God verbally and visibly identified Jesus as his son. Okay? Now... <clears throat> When, so we can look at this verse, it says, you are my son, today I have begotten or installed you. Now, let me ask you a question. What happened, we've talked about this before, what happened at the cross and the resurrection? What happened in relationship to the plan of salvation? It transitioned from a plan to a real process, okay? <clears throat> and it speaks of being installed or seated at the right hand of God. And I'm going to suggest to you that what's really going on here, what Paul is communicating, is the fact that <clears throat> as the plan of salvation transitioned from simply a plan on paper to a real plan, a real process 
that could actually work now. What is going on here is God is simply acknowledging the fact that Jesus is now in charge of this real plan. And he's going to take it through fulfillment right through to the end and make it a reality for anybody who has faith in him, both in the past and also in the present and also in the future. The lesson, if you look at the lesson on page, on page 21, makes this statement that I think is very significant. It says, our spiritual fathers, those who have lived in the past, <clears throat> died in faith. They saw and greeted the promises from afar, but did not receive them. Why did they not receive them? Because it was just a plan. It hadn't really been put into motion. We, on the other hand, have seen their fulfillment, their enactment, their putting into motion. It's now the real deal. It really can change lives. It can really save people. I want you to um, continue to work through the book of Hebrews here. Uh, next week, we will be looking at um, Jesus, our faithful brother. So Jesus is not only a son of God, but he's also yours and my brother. And we'll be looking at that next week. Let us bow our heads as we close for Sabbath school. Father in heaven, we thank you that Paul wrote this book, that he clearly identifies who Jesus Christ really was and is. And we thank you that you and I can, in confidence, live knowing that our salvation is a reality. Bless us as we continue to worship you this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.